I'm greatly honored to be here this afternoon uh, talking to this very distinguished group of physicians, many of whom I know well, sharing my thoughts with you on a very favorite topic of my neonatal jaundice and asking the big question, when to wait and when to worry? And I'm going to talk mainly on cholestasis or direct hyperbilirubinemia with a brief reference to indirect. And the reason is that you are all more adept at uh, taking care of indirect hyperbilirubinemia than I am. So this is a case that I want to share with you, and there is one more case coming up. This is a four-week-old, full-term, with birth weight of 3.8 kilograms, breastfed male infant, was noted by the mother to be jaundiced. Very active, feeding well, and historically, the, on day four, the total bilirubin and direct were 6 and 0 0.5 with a normal hemoglobin. Day 15, the total was 4.5, still a bit high. Direct remained normal, 0 0.4. Day 28, uh, the total was 7, and the direct was 0 0.6. Hemoglobin was stable. So the question is, are you worried? What will you do? Whereas case number 2, and then we'll go back to the, other, the case again. Case number 2 is pretty much the same story. Four-week-old, uh, full-term, birth weight 3.8, breastfed, active, feeding well, Day four, it was the same type of bilirubin profile, total of 60.5, hemoglobin stable. But day 15, there is a subtle difference here. The total was 4.5, but the direct now is 1.4. Day 28, the direct was now 3.6, and the total remained about the same. So the question is, are you worried, and what will you do? So if you go back, this is pretty uh, self-explained. In the first few days, it was physiologic jaundice. It uh, peaked at four and started uh, kind of going down by 15. But this is a breastfed baby, no other problems, and the mom reported and brought a stool for you to see, and it was yellow. And it looked like breast milk jaundice. And uh, are you worried? No, because all of it is indirect. And what will you do? Wait, reassure the mother, and that's all I would do. Whereas here, the, on day 15, there is already a direct component going up, and by day 28, it is 3.6, which is quite an impressive number for direct. And are you worried? You should be. And <laughs> what will you do? You have to do something, because this would be the result. This is the first baby I took care of 24 years ago who was diagnosed to have biliary atresia beyond three months of age. And at the time of the Kasai portoenterostomy, you can actually see the gallbladder fossa, totally atretic, no gallbladder. The bowel loop has been attached. This was a cirrhotic, ugly, green nodular liver. And uh, surprisingly, this young man just uh, is listed for a transplant at 23 years of age. He never needed a transplant before, but that is more of an exception. It's not the rule. Most of them with this kind of a liver would have gone on to a transplant within the first year of life. So just a few points to remember. Direct hyperbilirubinemia is always pathological, whereas indirect can be physiologic or pathologic. How do you define direct bilirubin, hyperbilirubinemia? And for me, any value over one milligram per deciliter is pathologic for me. Textbooks say two, but I don't want to wait until it is two. So beyond one milligram per deciliter, I put my feelers out. Or there is a definition that 15% or more of the total bilirubin, if it is direct, that is another definition. I usually don't use it much. I just use direct bilirubin over one milligram per deciliter. Now, jaundice becomes apparent mainly when the total bilirubin is about two milligrams or more. So why I say that is that sometimes at a level slightly below but still abnormal, you may miss the jaundice, particularly in a newborn baby. So the main thing to remember is jaundice beyond two weeks of birth has to be followed up, and we have to fractionate and find out what exactly is happening. Any baby who's jaundice beyond two weeks need to be seen and followed up. Just a little bit about a recap about bilirubin metabolism. The indirect bilirubin and uh, albumin are bound together, and it is presented at the sinusoidal membrane here. 
Inside the cell, it is picked up by a protein no, used to be known as ligandin, but now we know it's a glutathione transferase, very important protein, and there are mutations that could affect uh, indirect hyperbilirubinemia. In the endoplasmic reticulum, there is conjugation with the UDP transferase, and the conjugated water-soluble direct bilirubin is transported into the canaliculus and thereafter into the main bile stream. So any uh, abnormality before the conjugation, whether it's an increased load of bilirubin presenting to the liver, as with breast milk jaundice, or Gilbert syndrome, where there is a conjugation defect in the endoplasmic reticulum, and now the gene has been sequenced, will lead to indirect hyperbilirubinemia, whereas any step beyond the endoplasmic reticulum after the uh, conjugation takes place would lead to direct hyperbilirubinemia. A classic example is any type of infection which, will, which can cause intrahepatic cholestasis, abnormalities with a smaller bile duct like allergial syndrome, or an obstruction beyond in the main bile duct. So before I go on to talk mainly about the cholestatic jaundice, just a few common causes for indirect hyperbilirubinemia. Breast milk jaundice is very common. You see it more than I do. Gilbert syndrome, hemolysis, and sepsis, and the last two being more of a serious concern. Just a little bit about breast milk jaundice. It's the commonest cause of prolonged newborn jaundice, and it could last up to about 10 to 12 weeks of uh, age. It's now believed that there is a component beta-glucuronidase in the breast milk that deconjugates the bilirubin in the intestinal tract, and the unconjugated bilirubin that is released is uh, uh, taken up by the enterohepatic circulation back to the liver, presenting a big load. That's the current thinking. It used to be thought of as a steroid or free fatty acid, but this is the current thinking. Now, there is no test to prove that this is what it is. So we are obligated to rule out hemolysis or drug effects or hypothyroidism. And once all of those are ruled out, then we really don't have to do much unless the bilirubin goes up closer to 20 milligrams per deciliter. Because there have been reports of kernicterus Especially there is a peak of about 14 days to 28 days. Sometimes the breast milk jaundice can peak to a, a bilirubin of 20 milligrams, and there is concern. So all you have to do is to stop the breastfeeding just for about 24, 48 hours. That's all you have to do. The bilirubin drops precipitously down, and when you restart the breast milk, it does not go up much at all. And in fact, once you have a break in the cycle, you don't even have to check the bilirubin quite as frequently. Now, Gilbert syndrome, I really brought this in just for one point. Uh, usually it is an abnormality, a mild abnormality, hereditary chronic uh, recurrent uh, jaundice that usually presents at puberty because of the hormonal surges. And it's not very common to detect that in the newborn period. And the total bilirubin levels are low. But recently, the gene has been sequenced, and there have been a couple of studies where they found that if a baby has an abnormal gene variability of this UGT1A1 gene mutation on top of breast milk jaundice, so two problems, they could have a very high bilirubin just from breastfeeding. So you have a gene mutation for Gilbert's, plus you have breast milk jaundice. Now, in Taiwan, they also found that a third component, that is the ligandin or the anion transport protein, if there is a mutation, and if you have all the three things, the odds ratio for developing kernic trust or a high bilirubin level is almost 88. But that's more of a rarity, and it's happily not something we encounter much. So going back to my uh, main th theme here, direct hyperbilirubinemia. So how do you classify it? And it's always nice to classify it in groups of you know, like infection, metabolic, or anatomic, so you don't miss anything. Broadly, it could be extrahepatic, like biliary atresia being the prototype, cholidocal cyst, which is a little rarer, and intrahepatic bile duct abnormalities, such as arteriohepatic dysplasia or allergial syndrome, and there is a rare condition known as familial cholestasis, which is not very common here, but it is much higher in the Middle East population, uh, this, which is also known as Bilers syndrome. 
What we see and recognize more are infections, particularly the torch infection or syphilis, but one of the things that sometimes get missed is a urinary tract infection, particularly in a male infant with a posterior urethral valve, having low-grade fevers and feeding difficulty and deep jaundice. And we think more about the jaundice and sometimes forget to check the urine. And all you may have to do is two days of antibiotics and the jaundice goes away. And the mechanism is endotoxemia. The endotoxins act on the hepatocyte membrane and can cause intrahepatic cholestasis and uh, a, a, a decrease in the excretion of the conjugated bilirubin. Now, toxic hyperalimentation, which is an iatrogenic reason for cholestasis and sepsis and drugs. Uh, we recently took care of a baby who had uh, um, cholestasis from the mother ingesting carbamazepine, uh, uh, Tegretol, in the last few days uh, before the delivery. And uh, we, we chanced upon it, and uh, after the mother stopped it and the baby was not uh, given breastfeeding anymore, the whole thing resolved. Going on to metabolic, galactosemia and cystic fibrosis are two of the, two of the conditions, and luckily the newborn screen uh, looks at them and we are able to rule them out fairly quickly. But alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is not all that rare, and I have had three cases already within the last six months. And one of, those, one of the babies actually presented just about a month ago with the exact presentation of biliary atresia. Large liver, deeply jaundiced, and clay-colored stool. And only when the genotype came back that we knew it was alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Even the biopsy couldn't tell us. So that's something to remember. But most of the time, the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is picked up because of um, asymptomatic transaminase elevations that you pick up in a toddler who's getting liver functions for... Uh, because he's on some other medication or a school physical or any of those conditions. So it's an asymptomatic transaminase elevation. That's how I usually get them referred to me. Now, neonatal iron storage disease, which is rather rare, but again, we had two patients with this condition which causes profound liver failure immediately after birth. Um, now, this used to be considered as a prototype of a newborn hemochromatosis, but we now know it is not. What happens is that the, there is a fetal antigen that crosses over uh, to the mother and causes an antigen-antibody reaction, and it sets off a complement cascade, and the antibody from the mother crosses back to the infant and the fetus and attacks the liver and causes uh, either stillbirth or profound liver failure soon after birth. Now, if this is a more gradual process, iron gets deposited because this particular antibody affects the iron flux in the baby's liver. So if it's a gradual process, there is iron deposition, but if there is not, the baby just has profuse liver failure, bleeding from um, a circumcision or an umbilical cord dropping and bleeding from any sources, and they die unless they are transplanted. But there is now a new treatment using IVIG therapy for the baby. Now, why I'm bringing this is that this particular instance has an implication for future pregnancies, because if you have had one baby with this condition, all future pregnancies may be at risk, and the mother may have to be treated with IVIG during pregnancy, and that protocol is being developed in Chicago. Moving on, miscellaneous. Neonatal hepatitis. I really shouldn't be using the word hepatitis because it almost implicates that it's an infection. But it's not an infection, and I'll tell you a little bit about this condition in a little bit. And shock and sepsis of any sort can also lead to in, uh, direct hyperbilirubinemia. So biliary atresia, this is really the concern, how early we can diagnose it, how much we can improve the outcome. So it's an obliterative cholangiopathy, and we are not quite sure what the etiology is. Mostly presence in full-term, initially healthy babies and around three weeks of age, and there are two types, and the pale and clay-colored stools is a major feature. Now, initially they are healthy, but if it's not treated on time, they, most of these babies develop fat malabsorption, malnutrition, eventual portal hypertension, cirrhosis, and death unless they are transplanted. There is a small, about 10% uh, of the biliary atresias that are 
fetal or embryonic, and the clue to that is that they have other abnormalities like asplenia, polysplenia syndrome, or cardiac defects. So once you have those, then you would be thinking more about uh, fetal type of biliary atresia, and the jaundice uh, occurs almost immediately after birth. Whereas the classic ones we all see is known as the perinatal type, about one to 10,000 live births. And this is where the jaundice appears at three weeks of age, not at birth. And we just don't know why it takes three weeks before it develops, because we think that this, is all, this all starts in the intrauterine period. Uh, and it's also rare in preterm babies, and if one twin has biliary atresia, we have not seen the other twin having it. And it's also not familial. So we now believe that there is a genetic susceptibility, maybe there is some sort of a candidate gene floating out there, plus environmental factors, because some of the uh, studies have shown rheovirus and rotavirus and CMV, being affecting, affecting the stillbirth babies, but we, we still don't have any proof. And there is also probably a T-cell activity which is adding an immune component to it. So it all has to work out together before you see the development of this perinatal type of abnormality. Now, biliary atresia can be very confusing uh, at the time of presentation because the neonatal hepatitis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, cystic fibrosis, and allergial syndrome, all of them can have the same type of presentation even up to the point that you do a biopsy. So when you see a baby and when you start the workup, we do not send them to a surgeon right away. We have to rule out the medical conditions first. So just a word about neonatal hepatitis. It is not an infectious hepatitis, but it runs in certain families. And we see them more in SGA babies or preterm babies. And they, in contrast to biliary atresia, have a familial occurrence. And rarely, very rarely, they can progress to cirrhosis. But most of them have a favorable outcome. And by about six months of age, the jaundice is gone, the enzymes are gone, and the babies are fine. So the way we diagnose it, at the time of the biopsy, you can see the typical type of giant cells, multinucleated giant cells. Now, giant cells can be seen in any newborn with the liver disease because it's one of those non-specific findings. But here you see sheets and sheets of giant cell and none of the other features of the other conditions. Now, allergial syndrome, just a very brief mention. Rarely you come across those. So I'm see, say, talking some of the, about the common conditions and some of the rarer conditions. Here there is a paucity of intrahepatic bile ducts, and they have cardiac abnormalities, vertebral abnormalities, eye abnormalities, and they usually don't have synthetic abnormalities of the liver, but they develop hypercholesterolemia malabsorption, intense pruritus. Uh, I've known of people who have jumped out of a window because they could not handle the pruritus. They can become very miserable with the pruritus from the bile salt deposition. And the facies is rather typical. They have a broad forehead, deep set eyes, a long philtrum of the lip and pointed chin. Some sort of similar to a Williams syndrome kind of a person. And one allergy will look like the other. And sometimes the parents have the allergial features, but they don't have the liver disease. So it's a very strange uh, syndrome. Now, um, something more common, these are owl's eye inclusions, and I have an owl here, just for comparison. <laughs> this is a CMV hepatitis. And we're seeing a lot of CMV hepatitis, but, but luckily they are postnatally acquired, and they don't have any sequelae. They, they don't have it at birth. It's the perinatal type of CMV hepatitis that can cause micro, um, uh, small head, I'm <laughs> blocking though. And they can have other abnormalities like peeling of the skin and uh, pur purpuric spots and um, um, small for date uh, babies. So a lot of those uh, abnormalities can be seen in those babies. So. You have this baby with uh, direct hypobilirubinemia. The uh, direct bilirubin is over one milligram per deciliter. So where do we start? So we start with the detailed history, and this is where it's important to ask whether there have been other stillbirths, for instance, in iron storage disease, or preterm babies, or babies with jaundice, the neonatal hepatitis, and uh, a good physical examination looking for other abnormalities like um, 
heart disease uh, or anything at all, uh, cataracts and, uh, and peeling of the skin and things like that. So physical examination and a detailed history are very, very important. And sometimes half of the diagnosis is made right there. Then, of course, the fractionation of the bilirubin. So if you look at the total at a 28-day-old baby, and if you don't do the fractionation, you may totally miss the diagnosis. So fractionation of the bilirubin is almost uh, critical in the first phase of the evaluation. Examination of the stool for bile pigment is a very, very important thing, and please don't trust anyone, not the mother, not me, not anyone. You have to look at the stool yourself. Now, the hepatologists are a compulsive breed of people, and they train everyone who comes their way to look at stool. And uh, this is one of my trainees looking at the stool. <laughs> so this has a kind of a bluish color. This is not a blue stool. It's supposed to be pale stool. And uh, if you really want to see how pale the stool is, you'll have to separate the stool uh, from urine, which most of the time can make the stool look yellow because a deeply jaundiced baby has yellow urine. And this is why most of the mothers, if you ask them over the phone what the color of the stool is, and they'll say yellow because they are not looking at the inside part of the stool. So you really have to take some time to look at that. And a clay-colored stool is obstruction uh, unless proven otherwise. So moving on to the next step of the evaluation, laboratory evaluation, radiologic evaluation, histology, and operative. And if I look at the labs, I like to kind of divide it into two groups if you look at the liver function tests. So if you see primarily in transaminase elevation, AST and ALT elevation, uh, disproportionate to the um, GGT or alkaline phosphatase, I think it is more of an infection. So it's hepatitis, transaminase elevation. It could be a urinary infection or a viral infection. But if it's more cholestatic, that is, in addition to the uh, direct hyperbilirubinemia, there is an alkaline phosphatase or a GGT elevation, I will think more of an anatomic abnormality, something to do with the bile ducts. It could be bilirutresia or cholidocal cyst, which we have seen a fair number in the last two to three years. But if the synthetic abnormality is profound, uh, much more than the other two groups, uh, such as elevated INR or a low albumin, I will primarily think of a metabolic condition like galactosemia or tyrosinemia or iron storage disease. Now, if you have only a small amount of blood and you want to do one test from each group, I would probably do an ALT from the hepatitis group and, of course, bilirubin, and if possible, a GGT, because GGT expresses itself only on the bile ducts, not in the cell. And alkaline phosphatase can sometimes be misleading if there is a bone abnormality or rapid growth. So if you have a choice, you could do a GGT. And in, in the synthetic uh, dysfunction, I would do an INR, because it has, shows, has a rapid turnaround time, and it can let you know that the patient is moving in the wrong direction. So I would do an ALT a GGT and an INR, in addition to your bilirubin fractionation, and you'll have the answer how urgent uh, the next step will be. This is a sonogram which shows uh, what is known as a triangular sign. Now, this is very well acclaimed in Japan, and all of those series say that in biliary atresia, they will see a triangular sign, which is a band of fibrosis at the porta. Uh, this is from fibrous tissue. Now, in 24 years of uh, being in children's, I never saw any triangular sign until last month. We had two babies who had triangular sign. Strangely, one had biliary atresia, one did not. So there goes the <laughs> specificity of it. So we don't know. It is an operated dependent thing. We don't set much store by that. But absence of gallbladder is one of the keys to biliary atresia because that can be your first clue. You don't see the bile ducts very well in a sonogram, but absence of gallbladder will be a clue. Now, HIDA scan is much debated about, and there are some who favor it and some who don't. If I see excretion in a HIDA scan, here is, this is the HIDA scan which is picked up by the liver, no excretion into the gallbladder, even as late as six hours when there is the contrast in the bladder, but nothing in the, in the intestine. So no gallbladder, no intestine, liver and bladder are lit up. This means there is no excretion. That is not specific for biliary atresia. It can also be seen in cystic fibrosis and so on. But if you see excretion, 
in the intestine, it is not biliary atresia. So it has a negative value. So if it's see excretion, it's not biliary atresia, it's something else. So it helps me to buy time in my workup. Now, liver biopsy is probably the most important uh, way to confirm your diagnosis, and there are some of the features, the broad the fibrous expansion of the portal tract, the uh, biliary duct proliferation, bile plugs, these are classic for biliary atresia, and there are similar findings for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and neonatal hepatitis and so on. This is what a surgeon does. After we make our referral, the surgeon does an operative cholangiogram with the patient opened up, ready to go for a kasai. They inject a contrast into the gallbladder if possible. And here, this is a very fine operative cholangiogram that was done on one of my patients a couple of months ago. And it, the, the, the beautiful <laughs> bile duct was seen and the contrast in the intestine and it is not biliary atresia. And it's a very reassuring situation and the surgeon closes up and uh, the medical management starts. So what do we do about cholestasis? The definitive one is depending on the, the uh, diagnosis, the kasai, the, biliary, uh, the liver transplant. But this one is a little important because this is the supportive uh, group where if it's a neonatal um, hepatitis or any of the infections that are resolving, all you have to do is to support their nutrition by providing an MCT-containing formula. The long chain fatty acids don't absorb very well in the absence of bile in the intestine. But if you use medium chain uh, triglyceride containing formula, it's absorbed through the portal tract, portal vein, and you don't need much bile for the absorption, and they do much better with the MCT containing formula. We have progestamil, um, alimentum, which are two that we use a lot. And they, these babies also require a high dose of uh, white, fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And similarly, we also use bile flow promoters. We don't use phenobarbital for long periods of time because of the narcotic effect, and sometimes that itself can cause cholestasis later. So we use ursodeoxycholic acid or Actigol, which is a bile flow promoting agent, very safe agent, Almost all of the babies uh, with cholestasis are on that for an indefinite period of time. Now, can we wait on any of these babies? Yes. If the direct bilirubin is one milligram, doesn't go up much, and the stools remain yellow, and you're really, not sh uh, you're really sure the baby has nothing else happening, is it a resolving viral infection? Can we wait? Of course you can wait, but just keep a close eye. So the reason why there is so much of a mad scramble to diagnose biliary atresia early and uh, send them for a Kasai portointerostomy is because of this very sobering statistics. So efficient bile drainage occurs if the Kasai portointerostomy, this is the Kasai where the uh, loop of jejunum is taken and attached to the underside of the liver at the porta, and this acts as uh, uh, artificial bile duct for a long period of time. So if this surgery is done between four and eight weeks, the success rate is 80%. Between eight and 12 weeks, it is 60%. And after 12 weeks, it is 20%. So just a few weeks make all the difference. So how do we improve the biliary atresia outcome? We know that now, just as I told you, that if the age at operation is below 60 days, that is a very good outcome. And they have also found that 10-year survival rate is 50% versus 15% if the surgery is done be before 30 and after 90. Now, before 30, it's very difficult to diagnose biliary atresia because they only present at about 21 days. But we can still do better by trying to do it as early as possible, 45 days. Japanese are now advocating 45 days. But conventionally, we like to do it before 60 days. That's the best we can do. Experience of the surgical team means a lot. And studies have shown that if you do more, five or more Kasai surgeries per year, you're a great team. Guess what? In the last two months, children did five, two months, five Kasai surgery. So in two months, we became good. <laughs> we have been always good. <laughs> the other thing that we look at is uh, how quickly does the jaundice clear postoperatively? And uh, if the direct bilirubin falls to two milligrams per deciliter or under within three months of surgery, that is a good prediction for a, for a good outcome. 
But in the end, about 85% of patients, sometime between zero to 15 years, may require a liver transplantation. So what are the barriers for early detection of biliary atresia? Jaundice is common in the newborn, we all know that. And the routine newborn visit is at two months, whereas in some countries it is at one month. So there is a period between two weeks when the biliary atresia classically starts making its appearance and the two months for the regular visit. Uh, because the biliary atresia babies are healthy, there is no reason why the baby needs to be seen. So fractionation of the bilirubin for any baby who is jaundiced beyond two weeks assumes a tremendous amount of importance. And the other thing is uh, the stool color can be anything, and uh, it's very difficult to be very objective about stool colors, and that is also something the parents are not very, very much uh, aware of, and that's probably something that we need to uh, teach them more um, profoundly. So what can we do? Again, uh, I just um, mentioned all of that. Fractionation of the bilirubin, keeping an eye if it is more than one milligram per deciliter, early referral, even if you're not very sure, and if the jaundice is associated with the other type of abnormalities. And this is what uh, the Taiwan study did. It was a brilliant study. Between 2001 and 2002, they gave uh, a stool card as part of the health package to all the babies who were discharged from the nursery. 78,000 mothers got it. And then they went on to a more prospective study between 2004 and 2005, and they were able to improve the uh, Kasai statistics uh, from something like 50% uh, to about 75% who had the surgery before 60 days. And no, no, none of the babies after they implemented this had surgery after 90 days. That's an amazing statistics. Why are we not able to do it? I'm not sure because the National Institutes of Health had a workshop in 2006. They couldn't come up with any explanation why we can't have a stool card. I love this concept. Look at this. I mean, every mother gets this. So these are the three abnormal colors. So any time that they see this color, they pick up a phone or they fax it to the, to the uh, uh, care provider. And even if the color is OK, they still have to bring the stool card to the pediatrician at one month of age. And this has been a very big success story in Taiwan. And then Japan has done it, and they've had a great outcome. And I think Switzerland has done it, and they have also done very well. So this is the infant stool card. So what do we do now? And there is a tremendous role that pediatricians can play uh, in uh, improving the biliary atresia outcome mainly by you know, making sure that all the immunizations are done, early diagnosis and screening programs. And for us specialists, what we have to do is to make sure that the perioperative management is great. And postoperatively, many of these babies have uh, nutrition deficiencies, and some of them have to have very energetic uh, uh, nasogastric feeding regimen. We have to support the nutrition because if they are malnourished, their livers fail early, and if their liver, livers fail early, they cannot be transplanted because they are malnourished, so you get into a vicious cycle. Similarly, a cholangitis, ascending cholangitis is a complication. If you have good drainage of the bile, you can have more cholangitis because you have a, an open bowel loop sitting right under the liver, so they have to be protected against cholangitis using antibiotics, particularly in the first year of life. So there is a tremendous lot we have to do to make the outcome optimum as well. And finally, uh, liver transplantation has become a commonplace surgery, almost 97% uh, survival or something. We have whole liver, reduced liver, split liver, living donor, anything you want, it's out there. But, <laughs> but the, uh, the demand is far exceeding the, the um, availability. So the, the principle that we have started using is we start talking to the parents about transplant just at the time of the Kasai surgery, not, not a month later, not six months later, right then. And we'll say we are just letting you know it could happen. List early, because if you are a James Bond fan, you can only live once or twice. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to. 
So the audience here is uh, predominantly primary care, and you mentioned getting in cases of doubt or cases where you're pretty certain you have gray or clay colored stools, getting a stool for bilirubin. Now, that's not so easy. I mean, you could send it off, but lots of laboratories don't know what the heck you're talking about, even if you send a stool for bilirubin. So can you use a urine dipstick for the stool? Question number one. Very good question. Actually, the stool, we don't send it to a lab at all because there used to be a test called ICTO test. test. Yes, and um, the, in the early parts of, early days of my uh, <laughs> CNMC days, we used to have it in our lab and we used to do it ourselves. But now with the HIPAA and all those regulations, we are not even supposed to do a hemocult in our lab. So we don't send it off for an exam in the lab. We just look at it, and just by looking at it, even if you have a suspicion that it's a lighter shade of yellow or you're not sure, all you have to do is to follow it up by seeing it a few times. All of my patients know that even if they don't bring their insurance card, they have to bring a stool sample. Yeah. So that has but, worked. But they know, say, Dr. Mohan, here is your gift. Listen, That's what they it, you know, and I know, and I've been fooled, not everything is so black and white. It isn't gray versus yellow. There's sometimes enteropathic circulation or urine, as you mentioned, dark urine. So sometimes it's quite difficult to say, this is an acolic stool, and I would bet my life on it, or I'd bet this child's liver on it. Um, sometimes it's not so, so easy. So in cases like that, don't they, I think they still make ICTO tests. I won't tell if you want to do some in the office, I promise. Uh, it would be nice to have an ICTO test, but I probably might do something simpler because I might just do a total and direct bilirubin, and if the bilirubins are normal, whatever color, if whether it's purple or green or blue, it doesn't matter. But it's the bilirubin fractionation that would be the key. The ICTO, I, I think the ICTO test is probably out there. We just don't seem to need to use it. The, uh, the answer comes right away somehow. Mainly, mainly probably from the blood test, and the urine doesn't help. It only tells you either bilirubin is high, which is a direct bili. We don't know what the cause is, or urobilinogen if it's the indirect. Thank you for the question. My question is, you know, now the AAP does re uh, recommend a one-month visit, and, and we've been doing that for a couple of years in our office. And so, we, so I typically now, if I see a baby that just looks mildly jaundiced at that two-week visit, breastfed baby, thriving, doing well, I often discuss it with the parents and say we're going to plan on doing a bilirubin test when we see at the one month checkup if it's still there. Um, is that reasonable? It's absolutely reasonable. I think three weeks to a month we are still okay because it's usually after the month when you have that two week uh, scramble to get all the work up ready. So having in, uh, this, uh, ha being sensitized to the fact that beyond two weeks you have to watch out and between two weeks and a month if you get a fractionation you are absolutely in a safe zone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for, his, as, as usual, his super presentation. Thank uh, you. Doctor. It's an honor to hear <laughs> that from you. Now, when you say that in breastfeed uh, jaundice, the connectors is rare. Now, rare, I would, I assure it's not exceptional, because I haven't seen any and I've been around a long time. But uh, uh, are there any, any statistical studies that, for example, will give you a percentage of this occurrence? I have another question is, isn't it possible in boys especially, if you can't get those tools, because not everybody is peeing, every baby is peeing when they defecate, just to ask if it stains the diaper yellow, because that's, Usually they, they sometimes volunteer it. I also would like to know, you have Alagil, does uh, Caroli syndrome also gives you jaundice? And does the Porto Vino, uh, Venus Arnold Chiari syndrome also give you jaundice? Okay, I'll talk to, to you, I'll go backwards. The Carolis is a cystic change in the liver and uh, if you have the congenital hepatic fibrosis variant, you can get jaundice. They, for some reason that's not very clear, 
the re kidney part of the abnormality seems to be predominant in, if it is a part of the ARPKD uh, type of the profile. And the liver disease seems to occur a lot later. But it is in the differential diagnosis, Caroli, uh, but it, it doesn't seem to be one of the commoner causes of cholestasis. Uh, your question about the kernicterus is a good one. What has happened is that there have been some studies, and I can't say it's a huge percentage, but when uh, there, is, there is one study where they looked at uh, the cognitive uh, and behavior and school performances of some of the children who historically had um, bilirubin level over 20 um, from uh, breast milk jaundice, and they kind of felt that those could have been related to it, but this is a long span of many years where they did poorly in school, and they, this is sort of a retrospective data, but we don't have any... Although uh, the uh, peak of uh, uh, bilirubin could be at, uh, uh, from breast milk jaundice could be either in the first week, but if you miss that, sometimes it can be 28 days. One doesn't have the courage to let the bilirubin go beyond 20. And I don't know if anyone would be in a position to do our control study because who's going to do the control arm? So you won't do that. But there have been behavioral issues that have been debated as a possible, very subtle uh, change that could have ensued from the, uh, the bilirubin levels. And I think you, the other question was about... The uh, Chiaro syndrome gives you... Also. I'm not aware of it presenting oh. as uh, jaundice you know, in the newborn as one of those. ever asked the mother, uh, does the baby stain the diaper yellow? But, uh, I think this is a... Yeah, if the, ba the uh, diaper is stained yellow, the, unfortunately all you can say is that it, the, there is jaundice, but it doesn't tell you it's direct or indirect. So we are okay. a bit stumped there because, you know, if this baby has a breast milk jaundice, he's going to have a yellow diaper for a while, yeah. up to three, three months, so it doesn't help you. Thank you. Thank you.